Lecture four of the World of Sound by Sir William Bragg. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sounds of the Country In the country are many most interesting sounds. In a certain sense, they are more interesting than any others, because many of them are the very sounds of nature which ears were made to hear, and others are the signals of living beings to one another which have grown in richness of meaning as ears have grown in delicacy of perception first of all the songs of birds will come to our minds when we think of country sounds and the cries of insects and of the animals the songs of birds raise many questions which we must not stop to consider because they are too difficult to think of in the short time that we have there is just one point that i would mention we do not really know that we hear all the notes of the birds for our ears have only a certain range and are not sensitive to notes above a certain pitch the range of hearing varies with different people becoming restricted as we grow old for example do we hear all the notes of a wren or a blackbird mr wilkinson of leeds a blind naturalist of whom i will tell you presently thinks that the songs of birds sometimes go out of our range of hearing we know that some people do not hear the squeak of a bat or the shrilling of a cicada after all the birds do not sing to please us but one another and as far as that goes there is no reason why they should suit themselves to our ears in the insect sounds we find a number which we can understand by means of the simple principles of sound we have already been considering when an insect beats its wings so fast in flying that the successive little pulses of air link themselves together into a musical note we realize that we have a very simple illustration of the way in which a sound of definite pitch is made some of the insects actually make sounds in the very same fashion as we did ourselves when we held a card against the teeth of a revolving wheel we may take one of the members of the grasshopper family for an example it has on the edge of one wing case a roughened or serrated edge like a blunted saw on the other is a ridge so placed that when one wing case is moved over the other the teeth of the saw are drawn rapidly across the ridge every time the ridge slips over a tooth and down into the next hollow a little quiver is given to the wing and a pulse goes out into the air there is a beautiful little tambourine set in the wing you can see it in the representation of the wing upon the screen figure fifty one and apparently the use of it is to give a better send-off to the air pulse the flat surface of the tambourine vibrates as a whole up and down when the ridge beside it is shaken and its comparatively broad surface launches a correspondingly large amount of sound when we press a card against the revolving tooth wheels the volume of sound is increased by using a larger card though of course the pitch does not alter when we do so figure fifty one right wing of a grasshopper showing tambourine at tea the crickets have something of the same arrangement figure fifty two is an enlarged drawing of the bow which is used by the house cricket it shows the little teeth which correspond to the teeth of the wheel we have used in our experiments figure fifty three shows the bow of the field cricket the little projections are less rigid and are farther apart so that the chirp is not so loud and is a little lower in pitch chirping insects mount the bow and the edge which is to be bowed in all sorts of places on their bodies here for example is a beetle called cassicus americanus in which the rasping surfaces are neatly arranged to fit one another in the manner shown in the picture figure fifty four this beetle produces sound by rubbing the file on its leg b against the file on its body a along the insect's side is a dark streak which when examined closely shows to the naked eye a series of regular ridges the leg of the beetle has a corresponding series of ridges along its length which just fit into those of the side 
in fact the latter are so arranged that as the leg moves along them the direction of the ridges on the leg corresponds always with the direction of the ridges on the side at the place where they are touching each other at the time footnote for this illustration and much information most kindly given i am indebted to dr garn of the natural history museum End footnote. other insects have a rasp which is worked by moving the head as if a man were rubbing an unshaven chin against a stiff collar i have read of an observer who anxious to find out from what part of a beetle the rasping noise was coming oiled it in different places until the noise ceased another way of making a sound is used by the cicadas they have a little stretched membrane to which near one edge is fastened one end of a muscle by making the muscle shiver they cause the membrane to vibrate the figure figure fifty five shows a remarkable australian variety which the queensland boys call hollow bellies there is a toy which makes a noise in somewhat the same way a piece of parchment is tied across the mouth of a short piece of tube a little piece of tin bent into a cylinder one or two inches long and an inch in diameter will do very well a string is fastened to the middle of the parchment and the fingers are drawn along it a little resin on the fingers is very desirable the noise is surprisingly loud and resembles that of a small klaxon motor horn the australian insect it is only the male cicada which makes the noise has an extraordinary distension which is the origin of its local name figure fifty five a cicada which uses a distension of its body as a sounding board presumably it is intended to increase the sound not because the hollow resonates to the note but because the whole light structure will vibrate with the membrane and as in other cases launch stronger pulses into the air there is a small beetle known as the death watch whose ticking sound is much feared by superstitious people figure fifty seven a a death watch preparing to rap with its head figure fifty seven b a death watch rapping the moment of impact the little creature is however only sending signals to its kind and has chosen a very simple way of doing it it lives in wood and signals by wrapping its head thereon which seems very appropriate considering that wood carries wrapping sounds so well the figures figures fifty seven a and b show how the beetle carries out the wrapping process dr garn has told me that he has kept one of the beetles for quite a long time and could easily make it respond to the tapping of a pencil on the table footnote garn transactions of the entomological society london nineteen hundred page four four five End footnote. the ways and mechanism employed by insects of all kinds in making noises are very varied and interesting but it would need a naturalist to tell you about them at any length because so much depends on why each particular way has been chosen and that again on the life and history of the creature there are larvae for example whose hind legs have no purpose whatever except to make a noise by scraping certain ribbed areas on the middle legs the hind legs are of such size and form that they do this very well though they are quite incapable of doing anything else they simply move to and fro like the right hand of a negro minstrel playing the banjo there are insects which may be said to play wind instruments such as the blue bottle and the death's head moth there are butterflies that make sounds as darwin tells us in his account of his travels in south america there are insects that are considered to make such pleasant noises that the japanese breed and sell them for the purpose in fact there is here a great field of natural history which is full of interest but on which very little has been written systematically i am told that no book on the subject has been published since that of landois in eighteen seventy four die tierstimmen the noises of the wind are easily the most notable of the country sounds 
that is because our ears are especially fitted to detect vibrations or quiverings of the air and such air quiverings are set up whenever the wind blows through the trees and hedges or over the irregularities of the ground we may take two cases of sound caused in this way and considering them carefully understand the general problem sufficiently well imagine an ever-flowing stream of air to meet an obstacle like a branch of a tree or a fence wire it might be thought that the stream would simply divide and join up again leaving a little back water or back air we ought perhaps to call it just behind the obstacle which parted it but if the speed of the air is not too small something happens which is less simple and very interesting little whirlwinds are formed in the air first on one side of the back water and then on the other as in figure fifty eight and these pass on with the wind so that there is a long double series of them those on one side spinning one way those on the other side the opposite way the flow past the obstacle wavers from side to side and this happens even though the obstacle is quite still figure fifty eight six successive drawings a to f showing how air whirls are formed first on one side of a wire then on the other as the wind blows past it the black circle is a section of the wire taken by permission from report three three two of the advisory committee on aeronautics every time this alteration of flow from side to side takes place an impulse is given to the surrounding air and a pulse or wave runs away in all directions if there is an ear close by a part of the pulse runs up against the drum of the ear and affects the mechanism attached to it as we have already seen one such pulse by itself cannot create the sensation we call sound but if several pulses arrive in regular succession and repeat at equal intervals the blow upon the drum a sound is heard of definite pitch so when the wind blows past a wire or branch it sets up a regular succession of small whirlwinds and a regular series of pulses is launched into the air these when they reach the ear cause by virtue of their regularity a note of given pitch this is the origin of the singing of the wind it is known that the number of pulses set going each second by a wind flowing past a wire or other cylindrical object is nearly one-fifth of the number obtained by dividing the velocity of the wind by the diameter of the wire suppose that the velocity is ten miles an hour which is nearly fifteen feet per second and that the diameter of the wire is a fourth of an inch then the velocity divided by the diameter is 720 and the number of pulses is nearly 140 the corresponding note lies about the centre of the usual compass of a male voice when the wind blows twice as fast or the obstacle is only half the diameter the note is an octave higher and so on when in summer we lie down in the thin dry upland grasses there is the gentlest of whistling noises in our ears the notes are so high because the grass stems are so fine when in winter the gale roars through the bare branches it is torn into whirls which succeed one another regularly enough to give notes and yet there are so many of them and they vary so from time to time that the sounds link themselves together in a babel of noise when an extra gust comes the pitch of all the notes rises together and the roar becomes a shriek this curious partition of the stream with its accompanying whirls is the cause of many other familiar effects as the whirls are formed first on one side then on the other the unequal flow of air right and left of the obstacle tends to make the obstacle itself rock from side to side across the stream of air that is why the stays of a flagpole throb in the wind and the flagpole itself while in the fluttering of the flag we can almost see the whirls chasing each other down the sides the same effects are found in the water as in the air 
whirlpools are formed if the water flows with sufficient speed past a pile the anchor chain throbs when a boat is moored in a tideway the fishing line vibrates when it has a heavy sinker to keep it down in the running water a stick held in the hand and trailed behind a boat tries to go from side to side in all cases the vibratory movement is transverse to the stream when it happens that the note of the wind which depends only on its speed and on the size of the obstacle past which it is flowing is the same as some natural note of the obstacle itself then there is strong resonance and the note rings out loudly this is why the telegraph wires sing in the wind the aeolian harp depends on this effect for its music a great number of wires tuned to one and the same very low pitch are stretched on one sounding board and placed so that the wind may play across them that is all when the wind blows over the harp the wind note for any one string depends as we have seen on the thickness of the string and the speed of the wind all the strings will not be of equal thickness so that the note will not be the same for all of the strings at the same time if it happens to be the same as one of the natural notes that is to say of the overtones of the string then that overtone will begin to sound strongly sometimes one overtone of one string and another overtone of another string may be sounding at the same time all the overtones of all the strings are in harmony with each other because the strings are tuned to the same note a very low note because it is intended that the wind should excite overtones rather than the low note of the full string the music as it rises and falls has a certain wild quaintness because among the overtones is one that is given by a string when divided into seven and this is not found in our musical scale lord rayleigh used a simple method of illustrating this alternate dividing of a stream which we will copy he mounted a basin of water on a revolving table and set it going at a uniform rate we are now using a small electromotor for the purpose figure sixty rayleigh's experiment of the revolving basin the movement of the water sets the pendulum swinging across the direction of flow over the water and near to one edge of the basin is a pendulum the lower end of which dips an inch or two into the water the pendulum is so mounted that it can only swing across the direction in which the water is moving we start the motor and the basin begins to move at once but it will be a minute or two before the water inside the basin picks up the motion it begins to move at the edges first and gradually the motion spreads inwards towards the centre after a time the whole of the water is going round as if it were part of the basin meanwhile the pendulum has begun to show the side to side movement which we have learnt to expect even when the pendulum was quite still the alternate dividing of the stream with the formation of wells was set up as soon as the water moved fast enough the time of swing of the water stream from one side to the other of the pendulum rod grew shorter and shorter as the water went faster now the pendulum has its own natural time of swing which if we wish to do so we can alter by changing the position of the sliding weight we have in fact adjusted the times of swing of the pendulum and the rate of the driving electromotor so that the former is a little slower than the time of division of the stream when the water is going its fastest so as we watch the water growing in speed there comes a time when the impulses to the pendulum given by the dividing stream are just suited to set the pendulum swinging and at last as we see its movement from side to side is quite considerable if the bowl goes too fast the pendulum swings fall off again so we reduce the speed and again the swings are large in this experiment we actually see the side to side movements of the pendulum just as i have been describing them but they are reduced to a rate which we can easily follow the whirls can be seen as well if we scatter a little light powder on the water 
we can watch the whirlpools forming first on one side and then on the other we must remember that in the first place the whirls are there whether the pendulum is allowed to move or not and that in the second place there is a vigorous response by the pendulum if the timing is right the experiment illustrates two facts the first that there is a note when the wind blows past a wire even if the latter cannot move and the second that if the wire can move and the timing is right the wire may be made to give out a considerable note as in the case of the telegraph wire at the side of the road another way of examining the wind notes was used by a german experimenter strohal forty years ago i have copied his apparatus and we can use it to repeat some of his experiments a framework is mounted on a whirling table so that it can be made to revolve rapidly and it carries one or more vertical wires figure sixty one strohal's apparatus for showing the whistling of the wind the wires a and b may be of different diameters in which case they will give different notes when the apparatus is set in motion we hear the whistling due to the rapid movement of the wire through the air when we change the wire for a thicker one the note is not so high for the same speed rayleigh also used a very simple way of listening to the wind note directly which it is easy to try for ourselves we take a piece of glass tubing narrowed down to a small opening as in the figure and fasten to it a piece of wire as in the manner shown so that the wire which may be a twentieth or thirtieth of an inch in diameter is a quarter of an inch or so from the narrow end of the glass tube a piece of rubber tubing is attached to the other end of the glass tube and led to a stethoscope or a short length of plain tube which can be inserted in the ear or the rubber tube may be applied to the ear directly if now the wire is held in a draught such as passes through a nearly closed door or window the wind note is easily heard figure sixty two a simple form of apparatus used by lord rayleigh for listening to the wind note the wire is placed in the draught of a door that is ajar the alternate whirls formed by the wire send pulses down the tube to the ear in this case of course the wire is not vibrating so that the resonance of the aeolian harp does not come in at all the instrument must be pointed towards the draught so that the little whirls pass by or into the mouth of the tube after they have been formed by the wire if it is put the other way there is no sound because the mouth of the tube is now too far from where the pulses are formed and they are too weak when they get to the tube to have a perceptible effect the wire may be changed for one of another diameter in order to observe the corresponding change of pitch and the effect of changes in the velocity of the wind is easily examined also there is a second way in which the wind makes a sound it sets the leaves of the trees rustling against one another when they are made to rub in this way they start little shivering vibrations to which the ear is sensitive the way in which a leaf shivers in the wind may be studied by allowing pieces of paper of different forms to flutter to the ground the pieces make their own wind as they fall when a flat piece of paper two or three times as long as it is broad is allowed to fall it is readily seen that it acquires a uniform rotation and goes to the earth as if it were a wheel rolling down the under side of an inclined plane the fact is that as it slides down and sideways the fore part rides on to air which is still at rest while the hinder part rests on air which has begun to give way this cocks up the fore part so that it pays off before the wind the paper runs uphill stops and begins to fall back end now foremost figure sixty three pieces of paper of various forms falling to the ground successive positions of a piece of falling paper at a piece of paper slightly dished rocks from side to side at b piece of paper well dished falls down straight c 
the bull roarers of the australian aborigines work in this way they are pieces of wood several inches long and an inch or two wide swung round at the end of a string say three feet long they rotate rapidly twisting up the string as they do so their motion is exactly the same as that of the rotating pieces of paper except that the bull roarer is held by a string which it has to twist up as it turns when it has twisted the string until it will twist no more the twisting stops and begins to reverse as it spins round some fifty or a hundred times a second it creates in the air a corresponding number of disturbances or pulses and so causes a note figure sixty four an australian bull roarer twelve inches figure sixty five swinging a bull roarer made of a piece of aluminium sheet as it twists it flashes in the light which is thrown upon it the noise consists of a series of loud groans or booings one for each twisting of the string and is well calculated to frighten the women and children who are taught that they hear the voice of a spirit bull roarers are easily made but must be swung with a good piece of string because the string is well twisted when in action and a poor piece may become unravelled and break a piece of good linen tape is best it twists easily for its strength a leaf at the end of its stem cannot go round and round like the paper or the bull roarer but when the wind blows it goes as far as the twisting of its stalk will permit it then it stops and goes the other way thus it starts to flutter even though the wind is normally quite steady sometimes one may notice a leaf to be fluttering wildly to and fro far more than its neighbours probably because the period of each flutter which depends on the velocity of the wind among other things happens to coincide with a natural period of vibration of the leaf the leaves that flutter in this way rub against each other and hence the rustling in the trees the poplars rustle most because the stem of the poplar leaf is pinched and in section is more like a piece of tape than a round piece of string consequently it twists more easily under the pressure of the wind figure sixty six sycamore thicker here than poplar leaf poplar pinched here mr wilkinson observes that the rustle is soft when the leaves are young and tender in the spring but becomes harsher as the leaves stiffen in the autumn if we consider the illustration of the swinging bull roarer we observe that it is not going round and round in a circle about the hand of the man who holds it it describes a circle indeed but the plane of the circle does not contain the hand when you swing it you feel that when the spin is one way the bull roarer is edging away from you when the noise stops for the moment because the string is fully twisted one way and now reverses then the bull roarer quickly changes over and edges into you so that you must be careful that it does not hit your legs this is just what we should expect from our observations on the falling paper which turned over and over the edge of the falling paper slid to one side according to which way it was turning and the whole paper followed it so that it did not fall straight down but in a slanting direction just so the bull roarer does not go straight but edges away to one side a piece of paper which is not flat does not turn over and over it all depends on whether it slips sideways sufficiently easily take a piece of paper and turn up the edges as in figure sixty three and it will not turn over at all when you drop it but go down quite straight without changing its level one or two letters laid on top of one another to make a packet can be dropped down the well of the stairs in a set of flats and will go down all the way without deviating to one side one letter is not likely to get down by itself still less a postcard there is too little opposition to a glide to one side once that happens there is no hope because the leading edge that is to say the edge that leads the slipping 
gets on to new air which has not begun to fall this checks the descent and by comparison encourages the side slip the effect of getting on to new air gives of course the explanation of the motion of an aeroplane or of a bird if an aeroplane stalls that is to say loses too much way it begins to fall like a stone we see birds flying round into the wind when they want to alight they then stall themselves and drop gently onto their feet the same thing happens on the water when a boat is tacking sailing across the wind the water on the lee side is always beginning to give way and let the boat go bodily to leeward but before that happens the boat is away and leaning against a new lot of water suppose we are just able to sail up a certain reach of a river if the wind were a little more ahead it could not be done so that everything then depends on keeping going if the boat loses any of her way by running into some floating reeds for example she does not quickly enough get on to new water in consequence she and all the water to leeward begin to drift sideways together and she is soon into the bank it is sometimes difficult to get going again or again a rower when pulling has a mass of water in front of his blade which is giving way all the time if the boat is very heavy and slow and the stroke is prolonged the water may begin to give way so much that it is much better to shift the blade of the oar onto a new lot of water men rowing heavy sweeps may sometimes be seen to shift the blade up or down for this purpose take a broad thin piece of wood such as a paper knife and move it at a certain rate through the water broadways on and keep in mind the force exerted now repeat the experiment but keep moving the wood edgeways from side to side taking care to cover nearly the same distance in the same time in the second case much more effort is required than in the first there is one other point which we ought to consider very briefly it may be considered remarkable that a piece of paper even when its edges are turned up can go down straight because the least tilt would cause a side slip and a move on to new air but there is a well-known principle according to which a flat plate which is held against a stream of air or water tries always to turn so as to present its broadside not its edge to the stream these then are two ways in which noises are caused by the wind the aeolian tones and the rustling of the leaves with kindred noises they account for most of the wind sounds the air that shears past all sharp corners or through openings is torn into whirls though not perhaps in the same easily described fashion as when it flows past a rod or wire when the wind blows over irregularities of the ground and through the trees it must always become unstable and irregular in its movements all the more so when trees bend before it and objects sway from side to side so the whole air is churned up into quiverings and whirls large and small and the drums of the ears are hammered by the multitude of pulses that is how the noises of a windy day are called into being the sound of the wind in a wood depends on the nature of the trees the fine stems of the pine needles break the wind into whirls succeeding one another with great frequency and the sound is high-pitched but soft but the broad surfaces of the beech leaves tear the wind to bits and themselves start strong pulses in the air so that a beech wood is noisy when a heavy rainstorm falls into a pine wood it hisses but in a beech wood it roars echoes in the country are made by reflection from a distant building or cliff or even the edge of a forest the sound has to go and return before we hear it again 
so that if we halve the time it takes to do so and multiply by eleven hundred we shall know how far away the reflector is if the time is too short to measure easily we may use an old trick and clap or shout again just when the echo gets back we repeat this and count the number of times we do it for such a time as is convenient to measure and then get what we want by a short calculation it sometimes happens that the echo is not apparently of the same pitch as the original perhaps the explanation is not always the same in one very interesting case which lord rayleigh describes the sound of a woman's voice came back an octave higher than it went and he gives a very simple theory of how this happened in the first place let us realize at once that there cannot be any actual change in the pitch of a sound during reflection but a person's voice contains many upper notes or overtones besides the bottom or main note although it is by no means easy to detect the fact with the unaided ear so accustomed are we to pay attention to the main note only if in some way an upper note is returned by the echo more strongly than the main note the echo will seem to be an octave higher than the original in this particular case the echo came back from a pine wood rayleigh suggested that the longer deeper notes of the voice would not be reflected so well by the pine trees as the higher notes the fine needles of the pines would let the longer waves through when they might turn the short waves to one side or send them right back again we are all very familiar with parallel effects in the case of light the fine smoke that curls up from a wood fire is very blue against a dark background because the tiny unburnt particles of carbon in the smoke turn aside the short blue waves more easily than the longer red waves if you look through the same smoke at a distant light it is red not blue while the blue is turned aside the red goes on the smoke that rises from the lighted end of a cigarette is of a beautiful pale blue for the same reason but when it has been in the smoker's mouth it has lost its delicate colour the fine particles of carbon are now covered over with water which has settled on them and the drops are so big that they reflect other colours as well as the blue the whole spectrum in fact the finest example of all is in the air where the minute particles in suspension and even the molecules of the air itself turn aside the blue rays from the sunlight that is passing through the air and so make the blue of the sky when the sun's rays go through a great length of air as they do at sunrise or sunset the short waves are so well removed that the remaining light is of crimson and gold remember that the sun as it goes apparently round the earth is always trailing a sunset behind it and pushing a sunrise on before and the same action gives here the blue colours of the sky and there the colours that we see when the sun is low there is a beautiful old experiment which we may well repeat we mix two colourless liquids together in certain proportions in a glass tank through which a beam of light passes on its way to the screen where it makes a circular patch on the wall and then we wait for a few moments presently sulphur in an extremely fine state of subdivision makes its appearance all through the liquid as a consequence of chemical action when that happens a beautiful deep blue shines out from where the light goes through the tank and correspondingly the white patch on the screen turns a bright yellow the sulphur particles become larger and so the blue becomes paler because longer waves are added to those of the extreme blue end of the spectrum the yellow patch turns red till it has the crimson look of the sun in a fog so too when a heavy shower washes the sky a description which is literally true 
and brings down all the floating particles of various sizes the blue becomes purer and deeper because the finer particles of moisture and the molecules of the air itself are alone left to scatter the light at the same time the sunlight is no longer weakened so much by scattering when it strikes the cloud masses and is reflected by them into our eyes it has lost very little even of its proportion of blue and the clouds are a dazzling white lord rayleigh's echo is no doubt an analogous effect the pines return the shorter waves or scatter them while they let the longer waves pass on it would be interesting to test the result of the passage of a sound wave through a pine wood it might be possible to detect the special loss of the shorter waves and to find the note muffled and dull the change made in the character of sound by reflection at a plantation of firs is only one instance of many such effects there are well-known echoes at killarney which are said to return notes that are not the same as the original though they are in harmony therewith it is not possible however for one note to be changed into another by a single reflection the explanation of any such effect must always be that the original contained several notes of which the reflector cliff or trees or whatever it may be favours one or more in the act of reflection distinct and obvious changes like this may not be very numerous but the smaller and less obvious reflections that take place continually all return notes differing more or less from the original the original is never one simple sound but always a complex of many simple sounds and some of the sounds are sure to be favoured more than the others if we depended on our ears more than we do we should appreciate this point more thoroughly i have already referred to the blind mr wilkinson of leeds well known to naturalists as a very skilful observer who possesses in fact an astonishing power of naming plants and trees by touch smell and taste in his country excursions mr wilkinson has been obliged to rely largely on his sense of hearing he can interpret differences in the sounds of nature which the ordinary person scarcely notices and certainly takes no account of which of us thinks of the difference in the rustlings of the different trees in the wood or of the same tree at different times of the year or of the character of the reflections of sound by fir trees oaks and beeches he knows there are meadows in one direction because the skylarks are singing over them here blackbirds mean hedges a hush in another direction means that at some distance away there is a wood it is only necessary to talk for a short time to mr wilkinson to realize that in the country is a very interesting world of sound which most of us have not yet explored there is just one more country sound of which i want to say a word it is the murmuring of the brook if you stand beside a stream where the water is running now silently and then with a gentle plashing noise you will find that all sound comes from places where the water is white the water coming over some little fall has caught and taken down bubbles of air there is a multitude of little sharp noises as the bubbles burst noises of the same nature and origin as those made when a drop falls into the water and it is these that make the sound of the brook where the dark water slides smoothly over a stone into the pool below there is no noise at all end of lecture four